I'm going to show you today is actually something uh, is is a you know a little bit of a reuse of what we presented uh, in in Chicago. Uh, it was actually me and my client Christoph Stump. Um, Christoph um, presented some real uh, a really interesting perspective uh, that was the owner's perspective uh, that looked at operational issues, looked at uh, return on investment. I'm going to do him a little bit of justice at the end of this. Uh, and hopefully give you a flavor of what he presented. Uh, I'm not going to make as many jokes as he did. He's, he, he you know, uh, knocked it out of the park in the presentation and had the, the, the audience in, his, in the palms of his hand and had them rolling in the eyes. Um, so um, the, the title of the presentation uh, from the keynotes in Chicago was uh, A Denser Path to Clean. And what that means is, um, what we found in our practice is that the denser you can make a project, the more um, uh, residents, the more occupants that you can get into a building, the better form factor you can create, the more energy efficient you can make that building, the, the better you can kind of balance that heating and cooling loads, and it just makes it that much easier to achieve passive house. Um, so the projects I'm going to show you today, there's three of them, um, and they're of varying scales. They're all in New York City. Uh, two of them are in the Bronx. The uh, Grand Concourse and Santa Ella Gardens are both up in the Bronx. Vital Brookdale is in Brooklyn. It's my home borough. Um, and each one of them is controlled by slightly different zoning requirements. Uh, each, each area of the city has uh, different densities that are permitted. And these, these zoning requirements don't directly control the number of uh, uh, apartments that you can have uh, at each one of these sites. But just to give you a sense of like the, the density of each one of these, um, Vital Brookdale is about 160 units, which is, um, um, it is, about 160 units per acre. The site is about an acre. So there's 160 units on this one acre site. Santa Ella is about twice that density. There's about 320 units per acre. And Grand Concourse is 400 units per acre. So by far the densest uh, of all three, but pretty close to Santa Ella. Uh, that doesn't mean this has 400 apartments in it. It's actually 277, but when you factor in the, the size of the lot, um, you get that 400 units per acre. Um, the EUIs for each one of these buildings, since they are designed to passive house standards, and uh, Grand Concourse just recently got certified as a BS2018 plus uh, certified building. Um, Santa Ella Gardens was certified in, I think, in March of 2022, so relatively recently. Vital Brookfield is on its way to getting certified, but each one of them were designed to the standard. And each one of them, you can see, has really um, low EUI when compared to what is a more standard uh, average New York City building or the, uh, the national medium. I think what's also really interesting here is, you know, we all know that a building's on-site usage is not the whole picture. Uh, a more full picture is to look at where it's getting its energy, what time it's using its energy. Um, so, 425 Grand Concourse, which has no PVs, but is very dense, actually has a very high or a higher, a relatively higher source EUI because it's pouring a lot of electricity from, uh, from remote locations. Santa Ella Gardens and Vital Brookdale, they're actually considerably lower. That's a combination of their density, but also I think um, the more contributing factor is the fact that they have PVs on their, their roofs. Um, uh, Santa Ella has, I think it's a, a 110 kW array, and, and Vital is 100, right around 100 kW uh, array. Um, and there's actually this kind of interesting dynamic between the density of the site. When, you, when you've got more roof area uh, and less density, you can actually offset more of your EUI um, because you're producing more um, more power on site. Uh, for that density. So it's kind of a little bit of an inverse relationship. Um, so, but I still think going denser is better. It makes achieving passive house much easier. So this is Vital Brookdale. 
Um, and I think one of the really interesting things about this project is um, this could very easily be a, a, uh, a construction type that you see you know, outside of New York City. Um, as I said, this is located in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and a lot of Brooklyn is four, five, six, eight stories. Um, so this could very easily be a two-story podium with four or five stories of stick construction above that, which I think is a pretty typical um, typology, construction typology that you'd see um, uh, outside of these kind of dense urban environments. Um, so I think the, the, the form factor and the density that we achieve here is really, it's something that can be replicated in other urban environments. Um, uh, one of the things that makes this project really special um, is um, the geometry of the site. Uh, we ended up, it's a really odd shaped lot. We ended up creating two relatively simple bar buildings uh, that face uh, both uh, this street and this street. Uh, so we kind of made the form factor as simple as we could. It's still kind of a relatively complex geometry, but what that did was it created these these spaces between the buildings that we could create these uh, really elegant, uh, varied outdoor recreation spaces. And one of the reasons why that was so important here is this is um, this is a program, a building program. It's all affordable. It's an all affordable uh, development. One of the special um, uh, tenant types is. Uh, is a, a group that's sponsored by an organization, a not-for-profit called the New York Foundling. And the New York Foundling is an organization that provides assistance and supportive housing for kids that are aging out of the foster care system. So these, these kids that are just, you know, at the beginnings of their adult lives, trying to get on their feet, and to provide them with this high quality, healthy housing that has this really interesting and, um, I think appropriate type of outdoor space that's got a variety uh, that we can, you know, we've got a dog run out here. We've got a play space inside the building. We have um, game rooms and other communal spaces, homework areas. So it's a great program that's, um, I think, you know, it, my view of Passive House is that it should not be something that is available only to uh, the elites in our society. It should be something that's much more democratized and I think each one of these projects that I'm showing you today is achieving that. Uh, just to go back a little bit on some of the, um, the, the basics of the building, uh, the R value of the roof, and as I go through these, I'll just keep a, kind of keep a mental note of the R values. This building, um, we had to go up to R70. And I think that's primarily because of this form factor. It's, it's, a, it's six stories spread out a lot, at least compared to the other two projects. Uh, so just keep an eye on that, that R70. And you'll start, I'm going to show you a couple slides where that really does start to influence um, uh, roof insulation and certain detailing and, and um, uh, elements of the project. So here you start to see some really basic stuff. Uh, we've got these um, uh, night wall cliffs uh, that uh, inhibit the uh, thermal transmittance from the What's the metal panel on the outside of the building that's just clipped to these, these uh, rails with the night wall clips, continuous insulation as much as possible, uh, uh, liquid applied air vapor barrier, there's thermal shims in here between the canopy steel and, the, and building steel, um, but really basic simple stuff that's available in the marketplace. Um, here you start to see some of that uh, insulation. Actually, here you really see it. You can see we have three courses, maybe even four courses of the uh, aerated, uh, autoclave aerated concrete block. Uh, and that's because at the high points, at the perimeters of this roof, that insulation gets to be 16, 18, 18 inches high. So that's that R70 value that's, that starts to come into play in areas like this. And you can see how the door saddle is, is up relatively high here. You can see how these curves uh, are relatively tall. Um, so it was a, a significant design factor, and we had to, we had a little bit of supply chain issues with that much insulation. But um, you're gonna have if you have supply chain issues, you're gonna have supply chain issues no matter what. It's not something that I would attribute to passive house. So the next product I want to talk about is Santa Ella Gardens. 
this is about double the density of vital Brookdale. Um, and one of the interesting aspects of this project is um, uh, our, our clients and their approach to, um, to construction. Uh, Phipps Houses and Acacia Network, they are both two relatively conservative uh, developers. Um, and for those of you that work with clients, you might wonder, well, how would you get a conservative developer, a conservative client to agree to do like a cutting edge, uh, aspirational, low energy building? And the reason that we were able to do it was because of the elevated train. The elevated train that is right next to the building has some really great benefits, but some real significant drawbacks. The benefits are that you've got this great transit-oriented development site. About a block away is the subway entrance to the, uh, to the number six line. Um, so there's great, great transit access for the residents of this building. This is a workforce housing building. Um, the drawbacks are the train is very noisy. And every five minutes when this train goes by, there's a lot of airborne noise. So what that caused us to have to do was really think about the building's envelope and how the mechanical systems would influ influence the envelope design. So you can see, we don't have any louvers on this building's facade. There's no unitized ventilation that goes out through the facade. There's no grill below the windows for the PTAC or the, you know, whatever heat pump or whatever system we might have that would have a through wall penetration. So we couldn't do any of that. We had, um, so we, we really were kind of painted into a corner because these fundamentals of the site. So we ended up doing a VRF system for heating and cooling and energy recovery ventilation on the, on the, on the top of the building. Um, and so we were basically halfway or more to passive house. So it was a really easy sell to tell our client, you know, if you just make a little bit more investment in the envelope, you're going to be able to get all the benefits of passive house with driving your energy loads down, your costs down, and really uh, superior indoor air, indoor air quality and, and a really great uh, indoor environment for the residents. So with this greater density, uh, twice that of vital, you can start to see this roof value go down. Um, I also I'd like to think that these the insulation values on these buildings. Uh, with the, maybe the exception of the roof, uh, are really not that far off from what is uh, basically a code required building. Uh, you might get maybe an extra inch in the wall, um, but that's a relatively easy thing to accommodate. Um, so um, I think the, the one of the lessons I want everyone to take away from this is these dense buildings, the form factor that comes with that density um, and the number of occupants that you can get into a multifamily building, there's all those internal heat gains that you can take advantage of. And then it really becomes an exercise of striking that right balance and not over insulating the building and getting the right um, amount of heating and cooling because um, you can really drive down those loads with, the, with, this, with these high internal heat gains. Uh, so again, you can see there's no, uh, there's no louvers. Uh, you start to see the, the array that's at the top of the building. And you can really see how close it is to the elevator train. It's, it, is, it is so close. Um, you, you feel the ground rattle when the train goes by. Um, but it really allowed us to make this relatively easy pitch to our client to, uh, to be passive house. Another one of the great benefits of this project is that we had a contractor on board uh, during design. And what that allowed us to do was build some mock-ups test it, test out the sequencing and the configuration of things and the location of things in a way that made it more buildable and more cost effective. Um, the sequencing issues uh, were, were one of the, the key things that we thought about. The, um, uh, the relationship of the window to the, to, the, to the backup wall. This is a, a block and plank building, uh, which is a bearing wall and, and precast plank building. So as the superstructure goes up, the, the CMU walls, uh, which are behind the brickwork, um, all that backup wall and the slabs go in place first. And then you ideally want to have the windows go in. And those windows uh, are best installed when they're right at the, uh, or for, for sequencing issues, when they're right at the face of the CMU. But that does cause a little bit of a discontinuity, discontinuity with the insulation. 
So what we were able to do was through testing this detail with the contractor to make sure it was buildable and sequenceable and, and, and all made sense. From their perspective, we were able to test it with therm model it and make sure it didn't draw down our performance um, overly dramatically. So we were able to test it because we had both that um, we could therm model, but also therm model something that was um, more effectively built. And actually a very similar thing at the, at the window head. Um, this is the, uh, I'm not sure if it's fair or fast, but it's, it's, that, it's that offset relieving angle. So we can have the continuous insulation that goes behind it. But then we did a more standard um, window lintel above the opening. And these are thermal shims back in here. And you can see how that through wall flashing uh, flashes over it. Um, you can see our, our insulation in the backup wall. Um, but this was another one of those conditions that we figured um, was worth testing because it made construction a lot easier. We could eliminate that closure plate that would have to go up here if we didn't do a standard relieving angle or standard lintel. Um, so this was a real cost saving measure. Uh, but we thermal modeled it. We made sure it didn't draw down that, that performance uh, dramatically. So, um, so all of these projects we were able to deliver through this sort of strategy. Uh, we were able to, to deliver affordable housing buildings on an affordable housing building budget and achieve passive house standards. Uh, there's some more you know, details here. Um, when Christoph made his presentation, his portion of the presentation in, uh, in Chicago, um, he made a great joke that I'm going to try to relay here. It's not going to come off as well, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, he talked about uh, owners and contractors saying, oh, we can't build a passive house building. You need, you need twice as much cost to do all these windows. And he said that's a gross un un underestimation of how much cost you actually need. And he, you know, he's right. You need a lot of cost to, to make these buildings airtight, uh, and you're caulking around these straps, uh, and not just like a little bit, you're really like battering this thing up with a lot of caulk. Okay, 425 grand concourse, the one that I'm wearing the metal for. Um, this is the densest of all of them. Um, it's 277 units. Um, it is you know, over 300,000 square feet. It is, uh, it is really, um, you know, not, as, as parents, none of us have our, our, our favorite child, but this one's pretty close um, for me out of all my projects. Um, one of the things that was really important for this project, and um, I think part of Trinity's, our, our client, uh, the developer, one of their um, fundamentals of the proposal, um, let, me, let me back up a little bit. This site was, a, was designated um, to Trinity and, and my, my firm and, and the rest of the design team uh, in 2016. But it happened through a competitive RFP process, a request for proposals that was issued by uh, New York City. Um, and so there were lots of developers vying for this site to be designated. And one of the things that Trinity decided to do was incorporate Passive House um, to address what I think is a real environmental uh, inequity. This site is smack dab in the middle of the Mott Haven section of the Bronx, in the South Bronx, which has one of the worst childhood asthma rates in the city, or in, in the country. And the reason for that is things like the Major Deegan Highway that goes uh, up and down uh, the Harlem River. There is uh, several rail lines that come through just adjacent to the building. This is the Metro North Railway. There's uh, trains that are actually below grade here. Um, there's a lot of street traffic, a lot of deliveries, a lot of trucks, a lot of diesel exhaust. So you can see why the childhood asthma rates are so high. With Passive House, you get that indoor filtered air, you get that superior envelope that, that inhibits that infiltration and exfiltration. So it was a real environmental equity strategy um, to address this kind of this like really significant problem in this neighborhood. Um, I'll bring your attention to the to the roof. Uh, because we actually have so much less roof, it was so much less important to have that high R70 or R50 insulation. So we were able to do something much more 
uh, akin to a code uh, code rated building at R30. Um, at 26 stories, it had to be uh, a cast in place superstructure. Um, we have CMU backup wall for durability and then metal panel. Um, and on this building, we actually had to worry about over insulating. We had to really strike the right balance between um, insulation of the, uh, of the building uh, for both heating and cooling. Uh, so we had to really strike that, that right balance for this building. Uh, the ventilation system uh, was kind of a unique solution. Uh, we split it up into two halves. Uh, the top half, the high house, is fed down from ERVs at the roof. There's two of them up on the, on the high roof. And then a low house with two ERVs uh, at the setback roof. So we basically split it in half and have some car dampers. These uh, car dampers are uh, continuous air regulating damp. I think that's what it stands for. But they, they, uh, they adjust for that air volume to make sure you get the right uh, air volume coming into the space. Um, another um, really interesting part of this project is the complicated program. The development program involves not only um, 270,000 square feet of residential space, but a 28,000 square foot student center for the local community college, Hostos, uh, CUNY Hostos. Um, there is a 9,000 square foot grocery store. There is a, uh, a community, or sorry, a cultural center. There's a, a, a federally qualified health center, uh, a clinic that has both dental and, and family care. Um, so this wide variety of uses um, required that we think about some of the interior conditioned and exterior unconditioned spaces because it's so big it required a, an emergency generator. And those emergency generators have a lot of air that comes in, there's a lot of waste heat, there's a lot of airflow uh, that's associated with them. We also have a loading dock uh, over here that's associated with the grocery store that's over here. Um, so those things that have a lot of indoor or outdoor air coming into them, or the door is going to be open a long uh, period of time when you're getting deliveries and taking stuff out, uh, it made sense to carve those out of the uh, thermal envelope and create uh, create them basically as unconditioned space. So we have some double walls that have insulation, and then we have some thermal uh, breaks in the concrete slab here. So we just we thought about this quite a bit, uh, and it's it's. Uh, for these larger scale complex buildings, this may become more of a, uh, a significant consideration. Okay, now I'm going to shift over to Christoph's uh, portion of the presentation. This is a little bit of an edited down. Um, but basically what, what he did as a developer was he looked at the baseline case, uh, just a standard building, looked at what the passive house um, strategy meant and broke it down into envelope, quality control and HVAC components. And he came up with these premiums over on this side for each one of these categories that's associated with passive house. And then assigned a total value and then a cost per square foot. 13 bucks a square foot is not nothing. Uh, it's, it's pretty significant. But on a building this size, uh, when you look at the, those three pieces, uh, they really are just a little tiny slice of the pie. Now it's still a big piece uh, when you look at it in, in just dollar value, but when you think about the overall development, it is uh, relatively small. But then to further make the point, um, Christoph looked at kind of average costs uh, for a, a typical New York City building, and then what Grand Concourse uh, is anticipating to achieve with its with the uh, the energy model. And he's actually even goofed this up a little bit. Uh, to have uh, maybe a little bit more realistic and anticipate maybe some over usage uh, just based upon the density of the building. But basically between that baseline cost per square foot of utility and a passive house, the anticipated passive house cost, he's seeing a delta of $1.55 per square foot, which is about $480,000 a year of operating cost, reducing that utility cost by almost half a million dollars a year. So what that does, once you kind of factor that into a return of an, on investment with an annual interest rate that you're paying on that initial investment, that initial capital investment of $4.1 million, he's coming up with a payoff period of 12 years. Um, 
Now, I would argue that with energy volatility uh, that we're seeing now, uh, that that is actually a very conservative number. Um, and um, so, you know, whether it's 12 years or 10 years or less, everything after that is gravy in the developer owner's pockets. Uh, that's that half a million dollars a year of, uh, of savings is, uh, is not nothing. Um, so I think Zach said it earlier, I will repeat it. Um, we are in a um, period of time where we have not only an affordable housing crisis, um, but also a climate crisis. And the density that can be achieved with multifamily buildings in uh, urban and suburban environments, um, that density can be um, uh, can be achieved with passive housing. We can uh, we can address both of these twin crises at the same time uh, with passive house. Uh, so that's that's my spiel.